Uh, even ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown, doing this evening's presentation. Uh, fortunately, no State of the Nations later, albeit we do have a new president. Um, it's a big thing. It's been nine years. I mean, we've only had, this is only our fourth president in, 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 in the relevant history of this country. So this evening, we're going to be talking tax-free investing. We're going to be talking ETFs. The, this presentation has typically been fairly simple because, you know what, there's a couple of ETFs. You go, you buy them, and you put them in a tax-free. But things have changed in the last 12 months. And, 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 and not forget, you know, I'm not talking political and economic changes, just simple, good old-fashioned in the ETF space. But I'm going to kick off right at the beginning because I appreciate some of you have been to this presentation before, uh, I, but I want to talk around what these products are, how they work. So bear with me in that sense. We will quickly get to the, the, the meat of the presentation, but in the immediate, I want to just do some background. Um, the first is we're now, we've had three years of tax-free by the end of this month. Um, so the product, we, we're fairly well into it. It's cheap, it's simple, it's easy. And the short answer is it is working. And I'm trying to remember which final finance minister actually bought tax-free accounts to us, but it was so many finance ministers ago. But it was one of our finance ministers. Uh, was it Gordon? I think, well, was it, ne I, it was one of our, was it Nene? Okay. And Klankla Nene, then finance minister and Klankla Nene, uh, bought us tax-free savings account. And it really, I mean, it says what is in the sticker, but more importantly, understand what happens every year when the finance minister stands up and does the budget, is he basically reaches into your pocket and takes money out. That's a global phenomenon. With the tax-free account, what Klankla Nene did was actually reach into your pocket and put money in. And that's a little bit weird, but we've got to make sure we take the most of it. Otherwise, you know, he's only putting pennies into there. So the key thing is tax-free there is no tax. If you are within a tax-free product, and that's the critical part, you have to be within a tax-free product. You can't just, you know, after the event say, there it is. You've got to have, and we'll touch on that in a moment. It means no dividend withholding tax, which is a 20% tax you pay on all dividends. It means no tax on interest, which is tax at your marginal rate above the thresholds. No capital gains tax when you make a profit. No income tax. Uh, no security transfer tax. So we're not paying tax. Now, in the immediate, that's not a heck lot. But when you run this over the long term, and we come back in 2028, in 2038, and 2048, I will not be here in 2048. If I'm still around, I'm on the beach. When, you know, it starts to add up. It starts to become significant. And I'll give you a simple example. I own some Satrix shares, uh, Satrix 40 ETFs. Um, and my average price on those is about 16 Rand because I started buying them in, when they listed in December 2000. Um, and that thing closed today at about 52 Rand. So every time I sell it, I've got a tax liability of, uh, why is the math hard, 36 Rand per ETF. So I've got to pay tax on that 36 Rand profit. If I had put it in a tax-free account, which I couldn't because there wasn't, I wouldn't have that tax liability. Now, the secret to that Satrix 40 is 18 years. And that's, these work, but they need that time to work. There is one tax. When you die, it goes into your estate, and there is estate duty to pay. In truth, I'm dead, not my problem. But other than that, there's absolutely no tax in the process, and that's cool. Um, important points, individuals only, trusts, PTYs, CCs, partnerships, etc., etc., cannot have a tax-free account. But there's no limits on who that individual is. Now, there's an important point. The individual needs to be in South Africa, have a South African bank account and some points like that. But you can open them for your kids, uh, etc., your parents, whatever the case may be. If you're opening them for your children, the guardian, yourself, whoever the guardian is, does the FICA process. And they don't need to have a tax number. The law is quite simple. You can open the account. When the money is withdrawn, it has to go into a bank account in that person's name. So the child doesn't need a bank account today. They don't need an ID number. They don't need anything. All they need is a birth certificate. Unabridged or not, I'm uncertain. But they need a birth certificate. The FICA is done by the guardian, which is, you know, normal rules around the FICA process. And then one day when they want the money out, it will have to go into a bank account in their name. So you can open them for kids, etc. There is a, uh, uh, some, if, if you try and open one for a child and you get told they're under seven, it can't be done. That means you're trying to open it to the stockbroker, move to a financial service provider, and they can. That's just weird laws and stockbrokers and the like. But from pretty much day one, uh, if you haven't got anything else to do in the first day of your kid's life, you can go and open them a tax-free account. Um, your limit is 33000 per individual per year. 
So if you've got yourself and a partner, you can each do 30,000, 66. If you've got two kids, there's another 66,000 that you can do. 33,000 per individual per year. Important that year runs March to February. So it's tax year. So 1st of March, which is what, uh, 15, 14, 13 days time, resets, we can start again. If you haven't done your 33,000, you can quickly add up to that point. If you exceed the 33,000, you are taxed at 40% penalty. So if you put 34,000 in, that extra thousand bucks you put in, the SARS is going to charge you 40% on that. What's very important is that the growth is not your limit. So if you put 33,000 in and it grows to 35, that doesn't matter. It's the money that is deposited into the tax-free account that matters. And what's critically important in this space is that you can transact as often as you want. You can buy and sell. You can put 33,000, you put it into Satrix, and then you think, no, no, you sell the Satrix, you put it into S&P, and then you think, no, no, you sell the S&P, and you go and buy something else. That's fine. As long as it stays within the tax-free account, you can transact as often as you want. You can trade this product. You could do 12 transactions a day, and SARS is perfectly happy with that, as long as it's within the tax-free. There is a lifetime limit of 500,000 which is moot at this point. We're only three years in. We've only been able to deposit 93,000 over the three years. Initially, it was 30,000 for the first two years, then 33. So we've only been able to deposit 93,000 at this point. Once you've deposited 500,000 in, boom, that's it, no more. Now, the 500,000 lifetime limit will probably increase at some point. There's no rush on that because we're a long way from reaching it. The annual limit, as I said, went up last year. We've got a budget speech next week. Someone will deliver it. I have no idea who. Um, not me. I am busy on Wednesday. Um, actually, I could. No, I would not like a budget speech. Uh, and they may then increase that 33,000. They may not. I personally am hoping that they do um, because the more money we get in early, Obviously, the bigger their impact, the better, the better reward we're going to get. But we will find out about that on Wednesday. Um, cash deposits only. I'll talk about transfers later in the presentation. But you deposit cash into the account at this point. You can do your deposits as you want. You can do a lump sum, 33,000 on the 1st of March. You can do 2,750 Rand a month, every month, and that's your 33,000. You can do... You can do 100 bucks on Tuesdays and 500 bucks on Wednesdays and nothing on Thursdays. I mean, there's no restriction. The restrictions are the 33,000, the 500,000, the tax year. When you deposit it, there's none. When you, when you uh, transact it, there's none. So they're really simple, really sort of transparent products in that sense. Um, there are restrictions as to what we can buy. And the, the simple rule is they need to be collective investments. In other words, managed by the collective investment scheme, overseen by the Financial Services Board, etc. Um, and typically, we're looking at exchange-traded funds. There are also unit trusts that you can do. I don't like unit trusts, so I'm not going to talk about them this evening. Um, exchange trade funds, let's quickly step back and say, what is an exchange-traded fund? It is a basket of shares tracking a market. Now, what I mean by market. So a moment ago, I said, actually, I didn't. Our market was up 2,000 points today. In fact, 2,009 points today. It is the single biggest one-day point increase in our market. Percentage-wise, not. Um, we've had bigger percentages. But in terms of points, 2,009 points is a record. Um, and I like records on the good side. It's the downside records I don't like. So I'm telling you the market is up. What do I mean? I mean the index is up. What is an index? An index is a representation of the market as a whole. In other words, it's the average. So I'm talking about the top 40 index, which is the 40 largest companies on the JSC, which includes the banks and Pick and Pay and, and ShopRite and, and, and all those sort of companies that we know and understand and engage with, Netcare and, and others. Those 40 companies, what is their average move for the day? That's how we track markets. We've got the S&P 500, which is the same concept, except it's American companies. And because there's more of them, it's the 500 biggest American companies. What this basket does is it takes your money and buys you each of those 40 shares, puts it in a basket, and sells it to you. You could go buy those 40 shares, but you'd have 40 sets of costs, and it would be messy and complicated. And this is just nice and simple. And then when the market goes up, well, your basket goes up. And when the market goes down, your basket goes down too. 
But what do we know about markets over the long term? They go up. So this is a nice way of getting market performance. This is not going to beat the market. It's not what it's designed to do. The active managers, the unit trusts, they're trying to beat the market. In truth, after costs, only 15% of them actually succeed. So these ETFs beat 85% of the active managers out there. And that's why we like them. They're low cost, they're simple, and they do what they say in the sticker. They give you market performance. In the short term, markets do crazy things. Just a week ago, it was the end of the world, and our market lost 9% in, in seven days. Fastest collapse since the crisis of 08, 09. But in the long term, markets go up, and they go up ahead of inflation, which means we create wealth. You want to get rich? It's easy. Spend less than you earn, take the difference, buy an ETF, come back in a couple of decades. Done. It's just that simple. What you can't buy, exchange traded notes, commodity ETFs, individual shares, real estate investment trusts, derivatives, anything that has a uh, performance fee in it. So active managers say, if I do well, you must pay me more. If I do poorly, oh, sorry, I won't take your call, but nonetheless. So, but, so none of that. So it's just really looking at those ETFs. And we now have, by the end of March, we're going to have about 70 ETFs that we can put into here. So there is plenty, plenty choice. If anything, uh, overwhelming choice. I don't want to say too much because choice is good, but certainly overwhelming choice. Withdrawals, you can take the money out whenever you want. JC works in something called T plus 3. So if you sold today before the close, the money will clear on, sorry, what is today? Thursday. The money will clear on Tuesday. But beyond that, uh, so there is a slight delay, but you can sell it, you can take the money at any point. There is, however, a small caveat, which has not helped. It's designed for long-term investment. This is designed for long-term, and when I mention long-term, I'm talking decades. This is what it's designed for. When you put money into a tax-free account, you must have the, 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 the thought in your brain that this is money that I'm truly putting aside for 10, 20, 30, or 40 years old, depending on our ages. However, life throws us a curveball. And if a curveball comes along in a month, a week, a year, or 10 years, you can get the money out. You sell it, you withdraw the money. No problem whatsoever. And there's no tax to be paid on the profit. There is a caveat, is that withdrawals do reduce your lifetime limit. And here's what I mean. Your lifetime limit is 500000 You put 30000 into your tax-free account. It grows to 40000 You take it out. That's all cool. But when you put that 30000 in, your lifetime limit dropped from 500000 to 470000 When you took the money out, it stayed at 470000 so if you're drawing money out, you can't then re-put it back in. So that's the challenge with the withdrawals, which is why we say it really needs to be a long-term investment. And yes, if life does throw us a curveball, we can make a plan. But we should plan for it to be running for decades. Selling, as I said, transacting, etc., those are not considered withdrawals. Those are not a problem whatsoever. Providers, pretty much everyone within the industry, check your banks, check your stockbroker. I'm simple. I want a DIY option. In other words, I want to be able to buy whichever ETF I want. Um, and I want the cheapest transaction fee, and I want zero admin fee. Some of the, the providers are offering admin fees of maybe 10 rand a month. 10 rand a month doesn't stress me. Yeah, it's 120 bucks a year, uh, and that's not too bad. It's the ones that are charging an admin fee that is a percentage of the money. Because they say to you it's 1%, and you've only got 93,000 in there, so it's, it's less than 1,000 rand. And you think to yourself, yeah, 1,000 rand is just a good dinner. But what happens in 30 years' time when it's 12 million, and they're still taking 1%, and now it's 120,000? That someone's getting rich here for doing, with all respect in the world, they're doing nothing. So if there is an admin fee, as long as it's a flat fee and it's a reasonable, 10 rand a month, you know, that's 120 bucks a year, I could do something with that. But it's, uh, truthfully, there are a lot of providers out there who are offering zero admin fee, and zero admin fee is always going to be my favorite admin fee. I'm old-fashioned like that. 
Um, we've got discounted brokerage rates. Uh, you should be paying about 0.2 or 0.25% discount straight, low or zero admin fees, but watch out for those percentages per year. They start off small, but they become quite scary quite quickly. So we're three years in, returns have been modest. I'll touch on that in a second. We had 15 new ETFs last year. We're going to have 15 new ETFs by the end of March this year, um, and then probably more coming through. We have about 75 by the end of March 2018. The part I like most is that fees are dropping, the total expense ratio, because that ETF needs to charge you some money. Right now, the way the structure works is, and let's take Satrix because it's on the screen right now, is Satrix takes your money, buys the shares, but they hold them in a special purpose vehicle. So if Satrix, which is owned by Sunlum, goes bankrupt, no problem. Your shares are sitting there. It'll be messy, but you'll get your value at the end of the day. But there's costs involved. There's administration fees and transaction fees, etc. When Satrix came to the market in 2000, its fee, if I recall correctly, was 0.9% a year. And that was cheap. Back in 2000, that was cheap. You had unit trust running at six or seven. They've just last year dropped that fee to 0.1%. In the US, we've got uh, ETFs at 0.03%. And my prediction is that by Easter, we will have an American ETF charge a zero fee. And by the time Bufana Bufana wins something of note, Okay, that's open-ended. Um, or I retire, whichever comes first. We will have an American ETF giving a negative fee. In other words, they will pay you to buy it. They'll do it as a loss leader. You know, when Pick and Pay says, I don't know, buy your guava juice here for only two rand, and you go there, but you also go and buy other things. They lose money on that, but they make money on everything else. But there it's about a scale game. Yeah, they've got ETFs in America, the big ones, the, the Spider, the Vanguard, the uh, BlackRock, these are ETFs that have got assets under management in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So it is about a scale game. We will get there, but like when Bufana Bufana win the World Cup back to back, then we're in biz. And the other big news last year was that Signia took over the Deutsche Bank X Tracker ETFs, not the ETNs, just the five ETFs, which was Japan, UK, US, World, and Europe. And they have rebranded them as ITRIX. <laughs> Tricks with an X. I dropped this in, so I thought it was coming later in the presentation. So that's a quick recap of tax-free and a quick recap of, of what we saw happening last year. Those of you who came to my December ending, my presentation in December, positioning your portfolio for 2018, I talked around a whole bunch of stuff. The video is at justonelap.com if you want to go over a look at it. I don't want to rehash it. But the question I've been getting asked a bunch is, yeah, markets are doing great, but, you know, really, is this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm talking about here is there is a wall of money coming into our, stock, into our stock market right now. And there are two ways that we can identify the wall of money. The first, last year, the JSC, on average, did about 16, 17 billion rand of value per day. This year, they're doing 28. It's an extra 11 or 12 billion rand a day coming into our market. That, in my math, is a wall of money. This is Bloomberg showing us the average 30-day rolling period of net foreign buyers of our market. We can see that uh, pretty much since we lost the finance minister so carelessly, the foreigners have been sellers. And again, in the crisis of 08 to 09, foreigners were sellers. What we also see is that we have got foreigners buying our market like they have never bought it before. What I'm basically saying is don't be scared of this bull market we are currently experiencing. We are experiencing it for a bunch of reasons. Truthfully, the foreigners are coming rushing into our market. They're buying our assets. So are local people buying our assets. Why? Well, because our market is cheap, because other emerging markets have done well, and we haven't, and the reasons are, you know, whatever the reasons are don't matter. Um, and foreigners want to buy EMs. And right now, we're an attractive EM in this space, and there's a wall of money coming in which means you want SA Inc. And I spoke about that in the December presentation. The best representation of SA Inc. on our ETF space is the Ashburton Midcap. Those are the second tier stocks, not the big 40. Those are numbers 41 to 100. And they, they're the, they're the Midcap. So they're the small businesses, but they operate more in South Africa. Whereas those top 40 ones are more the global businesses, Richmonts and, and BHP Bulletins and the like. So your Ashburton is your SA Inc. What this does also mean is that Iran is going to get stronger. Iran is going to 10, 
to my mind, that's almost a no-brainer. In truth, it might even get down into the into the eight. Who knows? There's someone on a WhatsApp group that when he gives to seven, I'm going to stab him with a seven. Um, but uh, 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 the rand is going to get stronger. And then everyone's like, ooh, rand stronger. Ooh, we mustn't go must offshore. No, no, no. You go offshore when the rand is strong. You don't go offshore when it crashes. What happens? The rand crashes, and we all like panic, and we rush our money offshore. And you rushed it at 1850 when Nene got fired, and now it's 1160, and you're like, yo, hoi, hoi. Can't we fire another finance minister? <laughs> Truthfully, we have run out of finance ministers to fire. Quick story. So we go back to December 2001. Our rand crashed to 1361. At that point, the worst level it had ever traded at. And people rushed money offshore. The rand then strengthened to 575 in the next four years and only breached 1361 when Minister Nene got fired. In other words, 14 years later. You want to buy the rand when it's stronger. Let's say we start buying the rand now using offshore ETFs. And we buy the rand, and it goes all the way down to, let's say, nine rand. So we get an average of around 10 bucks. Anyone here think that one day our rand won't be 20? Of course it will. When? Ah, in the future. Our currency will always weaken against the U.S. dollar over the long term by the inflation differential. So if our average inflation is 5%, and the U.S. average inflation is 1%, our RAND will weaken 4% a year. But it doesn't do it in a straight line. No, 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 no. This RAND is drunk. It goes here, it goes there, it goes there. The boogie's off around the corner. So you buy the RAND now, and you get an average of 10 or 11. And at some point in the future, with or without the help of politicians, our RAND will be 20. And you've had a 100% return just on currency. In other words, you buy the RAND when it is strong. And I'm not saying you now rush offshore and take everything you have. I'm saying just don't be stressed by it. You're buying foreign ETFs, the rand's 11, 8, 60. Next year it's 10, and you're like, oh, I've lost. Yeah, yeah, in the short term it's hurting. But our rand will be 20 one day. Hopefully not any day soon. And then you've had a 100% uplift just from the currency, plus whatever the other return has been. So don't be scared of the rand. It is going to get a lot stronger. So, new ETFs in 27, we had the Ashburton Global 1200, which is pretty much everything except Africa. Um, it's predominantly emerged markets, which is Western Europe and North America, but it includes Asia. It's got some Latin America. I very much like that ETF. We had the Satrix Quality SA ETF. We had the Satrix Emerging Market ETF. That's nice. We're already an emerging market. What Satrix Emerging Market does is it removes single geography risk. You know, so we fire our finance minister, things go wrong. And, but whereas that is a whole bunch of emerging markets, so we'd have to fire about 20 finance ministers. Um, the Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution, I'll talk about that in a bit. The Africa SS, XSA from Cloud Atlas, which is giving you investments into Africa, but it's excluding South Africa, which I like. If you want to get the Africa exposure, you don't want South Africa because you've already got it because we're buying top 40, Satrix 40, and stuff like that. This gives us the rest of the continent. Quick point on the rest of the continent. Typically, we think, oh, yeah, rest of the continent must be all about mining. Mm -mm. The mining is typically state-owned. The rest of the continent is telcos, is brewers, oddly enough, um, is banks, Kenya, Morocco, uh, uh, yeah, Egypt, all of that. Um, some new top 40s. We now have four top 40 ETFs. By the end of March, we will have three MSCI World, and we will have four S&P 500. And they're all the same. Top 40 is top 40. Top 40, we have got Ashburton, Stanlib, Satrix, and Signia. CoreShares has a top 40 capped and a top 50. So we parked those. So we've got four. And we're going to see more of that coming through. That's cool gives me a choice. What's the difference between the four top 40s? Nothing. So what matters? Price. Do you charge 0.1% or 0.2%? Because if you charge 0.1, I like that. Unless someone charges 0.01, in which case, well, then I like that one. It means prices are going to come down. Competition. Lovely thing. 
And then new ETFs, which are coming in the first quarter of this year. This list is not comprehensive. Neither was the previous list. Uh, Ash, uh, sorry, my battery is going. Ah. CoreShares is listing a global dividend aristocrat ETF. I'm going to talk more about it in a bit. Quick point is it is the IPO closed today. So it will list next uh, 22nd, Thursday. Um, it's a global dividend. What they're doing is they're not, it doesn't mean it, it pays high dividends. They use dividends as the metric for selection. So if you want to be included in the US part of that ETF, you have to have paid a dividend for 25 years, which means no Google, no Facebook, no Twitters, because they didn't exist 25 years ago. We've got a couple coming from Stanlib. They will come in the new, in the, sorry, in the new year. They will come in March. There's an S&P Infotech, which is a feeder ETF. I'll touch on feeder in a moment. And there's a, a global government bond index. They've actually got a, an MSCI as well and an S&P 500 and a global property. But those are the two particular of interest. The S&P Infotech doesn't interest me. I'll touch on it in a bit. The global government bond index does. The one thing we've been missing in our building blocks of ETFs in this country was global bonds, in other words, bonds beyond our border. We can buy local government bonds, but now we can buy beyond our border. The attraction of those offshore bonds is that they're in foreign currency. The detraction is that they have incredibly low rates. Uh, U.S. bonds are about 2%. That's uh, not terribly exciting compared to our 7 8 9% locally. Um, but you get the currency. Uh, Cloud, Act, uh, is, uh, Cloud Atlas is listing a Africa S. XSA REIT ETF, Real Estate Investment Trust. So property into, into the rest of the continent, excluding South Africa. That is currently an IPO listing uh, in, in, in March. And then ABS has got a bunch of ETFs coming in March, Active Index Strategies, they call it. What they're trying to do is they're trying to, so, so when a market is running high and moving higher, there will be 100% in equities. But as that market starts to fall, they'll start moving into cash. So what they're trying to do is falling markets, you won't take too much pain, but running markets, you'll get it. Uh, what what, what they, they comment they made at, a, at an event here on Tuesday was fall in the hole less often and get out quicker. And there'll be lots coming around that. We're going to be doing some work with them around it as well. Um, but those are also only coming in March 2018. Uh, the only one of those listing ahead of the February cutoff is the core shares, which lists next week. The rest are all going to list in March. Yes. Okay. So feeder ETFs. This was one of the other new phenomenons that we saw in 2017 and a number of the ones, for example, all the standalone ones are all going to be feeder ETFs. What a feeder ETF does is it says, so I want to have an, an S&P 500 ETF and I have to go to America and I buy the 500 shares and then I take my rands and I convert them into dollars and I buy the shares and I price it. and I bring, uh. What a feeder does is it just goes and buys an existing S&P 500 ETF listed on in New York. In other words, it's an ETF that holds an ETF that holds 500 shares. Two challenges to that. One, does it add risk to the process? Short answer is no, because these ETFs listed in New York are also collective investment schemes. They also hold the underlying shares so that if anything goes wrong, it is being held. Um, and also, it's companies such as BlackRock, which is you know, one of the largest financial services companies in the world. And if BlackRock goes bust, we've got, frankly, bigger problems. Um, we need to find water, like Cape Town, I suppose. So to me, the risk in that is, is not a problem. The costs, in truth, what we're going to see with these feeder funds, particularly up front, is they're going to be a lot cheaper than the competitors because it's about a scale game. So remember I said that the U.S. ETFs are 0.03% tour, and there will be ETFs at a 0% tour because they've got scale. We can't do that in South Africa because we don't have scale. In time, we might get there, but we, at this point, don't have the scale. So what these are doing is they go and take a really cheap ETF that charges whatever, and they add their fee on top, but they're able to do it cheaper than the ETF, which is not a feeder fund. So I'm agnostic as to whether an ETF is feeder or not. To me, it's about the fees. If the fees work in my favor, I'm absolutely happy, and I'm prepared to pay for, to, to buy it. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more feeder funds coming through. They're easier for the issuer. They, 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 they're quicker to list, um, and they start off at lower cost. 
you know, when you start an ETF and you've got 5 million Rand invested in it, you've got a lot of cost base that you've got 5 million Rand has to cover. But as you grow it, that cost base doesn't increase at the same rate. You get the leverage impact and the cost can come down. But you start with the feeder, well, boom, you've got a 0.1% or 0.03% ETF plugging in. It is cheaper. So then the key point. So ETFs are passive. What I mean by passive, an ETF will track the market. Our market is up 2,009 points today, which means that the Satrix 40 ETF is up two round and one cent because they have it divisible by 10. And they track. They're passive. In other words, they don't beat the market. They don't underperform the market. They just do the market. And that's lacquer. That's what we like them for. But the action of picking an ETF is active. Now, some of that active is deciding between two top 40 ETFs, and then it's on price. But some of that active is, do I want the top 40 or the, 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 uh, the, the equal weight? Do I want S&P or do I want MSCI World? And these are now active decisions. As soon as we run into the active, what are we trying to do? We build these complex ETF portfolios that we are building to try and beat the market, which is exactly what an ETF is not designed to do. We are overcomplicating something that is incredibly simple. So there's a theory out there. Well, okay, it's Christie's theory. It's still, it's a theory, it's out there. One ETF to rule them all. Why don't we just buy one? One ETF that tracks everything. And so, intuitively, I like the idea. Truthfully, it kind of scares me a little bit. But that's partly because I come from an active background. You know, I, I pick shares, I trade indices and currencies and other such foolish things. This whole idea of, you know, just one. The corollary to it is be very careful of having 15 ETFs because then you're actually just going to end up with the same return as one. You know, it's like if, you, if you're buying shares but you own 100 shares, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get market return, so you may as well just have bought the ETF to got that market return anyway. And it comes to how we structure the portfolio, and I'll touch on my portfolio in a few slides times. But... The reason I'm putting this here is particularly now that there's this proliferation of new ETFs out there, we've got to be careful of using them to chase return and basically defeating what their simple purpose is. So who ate my returns? When I put this slide up a year ago, it looked ugly. At least now we're getting some green coming, admittedly mostly in the five-year column and in the, the Signia uh, MSCI 6 uh, worldwide index. But we had a market that went nowhere, literally, for three years up until three and a half years to August of last year. Our market did nothing. Now our market is running. We are in a bull market. I anticipate that bull market continuing until something goes horribly wrong. And I don't know what or when that horribly wrong will be. Truthfully, I hope it is like 2020 or 21 or something like that. It could be Tuesday, but let's hope it's not Tuesday. But we're certainly in the five-year column seeing some returns. And the Signia did all right. Last year, it hurt because of the currency impact. Um, but three years ago, of course, is taking us back to just pre-Nene firing, firing. But already at that point, the RAND was, was what, 12.50, now we're 11.60. Um, and five years we go back, the RAND was probably 10-ish or there's about. I'm trying to remember that far back. But at least we're starting to see some green in it. The point with all of that is five years is irrelevant. I can't do you 10 years because none of these have existed for 10 years. But truthfully, if you want to know what your returns are, and if you're looking at anything less than a 10-year period, nah, it's noise. These are long-term investments measured in decades, not hours, days, weeks, or anything. But we're getting some returns, and that does exclude dividends, which does switch that and that and that into a green, just not the, uh, the, the prop tracks 10. So let's quickly compare some bunches of, of ETFs offshore. I've done this again because I did it last year, because last year for the first time we started getting some new stuff coming through. Now this list is getting a little out of control. So we've got the, the, the Signia US, that X shouldn't be there, which tracks the MSCI US 600. Pretty much it's the same as the uh, uh, S&P 500. Those extra 100 stocks don't add much. We have four 
uh, S&P 500 ETFs. The last one is still to come, but the other three are already there. By my math, the Signia one is the cheapest of the four. Um, we now also have the what used to be the Deutsche Bank Worldwide X Tracker is now the Signia, uh, and we now have three of them: Signia, Satrix. And uh, Stan Lib will be listing one in March as well. And they track the MSCI. The difference between those two is quite small because I understand the S&P 500. Sure, it's the 500 biggest companies in America. But what do those companies do? They sell their stuff everywhere. When we buy Coca-Cola and, and, and iPhones in South Africa, and those profits go back to Coca-Cola and Apple in the US. And here's the really interesting point. Geographically, the split between the the... the MSCI 600, which are those bottom three, and the S&P 500, geographically, their revenue split between the different regions is pretty much the same. Key difference, S&P 500 has tech as its biggest sector and financials as its second biggest. The MSCI, which is the bottom three, has financials as its biggest sector and tech as its second biggest sector. That makes sense because, you know, the, 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 the tech giants are sitting in, in, in America, less so the rest of the world. Uh, maybe I should just stand still. Um, property, we've got the Pop Tracks, Pop Tracks 10, which is a local one, the top 10 biggest companies split uh, in equal weight. We now got three offshore properties. The bottom one is only coming next month. Uh, that is the one from Core Shares, came late year before last. That's the Signia, and now uh, there is uh, the one coming from Stanlib, which is global property. And then below that is the Satrix, which is a local property, but capped. No stock is more than 10% in the index. Um, and then locally, we've got the core shares equal weight, and then we've got the four uh, uh, ETFs, uh, the top four, top 40 ETFs. The cheapest of that is currently Satrix 40 at 0.1%. The other three, as they gain size will see their fees come down as well. I want to say two things, a couple of things here quickly. Firstly, be careful of switching to save a small amount of money because there are costs involved in switching. I sell an ETF, I buy an ETF, I've got to pay transaction fees, which all in is about 0.5% plus taxes. Let's call it half a percent. So if I'm saving 0.05%, but I'm paying half a percent, it's going to take me 10 years to get that saving to pay off. And maybe the ETF I'm selling will, at some point in those 10 years, actually reduce their fees. And then there's one other cost that's important, and that's the spread. In other words, you go to market and you sell it, and then you go to market and you buy it. And when you sell it, there's a buyer at 50 and a seller at 50, 20. So you sell at 50. And then when you buy it, you've got to buy it at 50, 20. So you've got that spread as well. So be very careful about just willy-nilly rushing off and saying, oh, cheaper, like... Run the math. Do a spreadsheet. You'll want a payback time of three or four years. If it's more than that, it might not be actually worth it because in that period, the one you're selling probably dropped their fees and suddenly your payoff time is 22 years and the only person who made money was your stockbroker. Um, the core shares equal weight is exactly the same stocks that sit in the top 40, but what it does is every stock is 2.5%, whereas the top 40 says the bigger you are, the more relevance you have. So we have NASPAS in excess of 20%, whereas in a core shares, NASPAS is 2.5%. My preference has and always has been for the equal weight. I like that equal weight. I've got nothing against uh, NASPAS, Tencent, and Chinese teenagers using WeChat, etc. Um, and, and in truth, so, you know, we look at the NASPAS at 20% weighting in the index and we're like, oh, this index is broken. This is terrible. No, no. This is what happens. In 2007, Billiton and Anglo were 34% of our index. In 2000, it was tech stocks. We've seen this story before, that, that, that certain stocks or sectors or some giants become overly de uh, big in the index. And, and the market then kind of works it and flushes it out. And, you know, there, there was no one died in the process. You know, it's not the end of the world. People look at this and like, oh, this NASPAS, this is the end of the top 40. This is terrible. We need to make a new end. We tried that. Back in the early 2000s, we looked at the top 40. I used the royal we. In other words, those people. Not you people. The ones upstairs in the building. Looked at the top 40 and said, oh, this is terrible. I know. We'll make a SWIX index. Shareholder weighted. Ah, that'll solve the problem, except that in SWIX, next pass is 38%. So the index, the problem when you make an index to solve a problem is you make the index for this point in time. 
And then the future happens and something happens that you hadn't anticipated. And it's like, oh dear, we've just made the worst index in the world. The SWIX is the worst index in the world. I, I will defend that point anytime. I, I'd rather buy the Bolivian top two than the SWIX. <laughs> I'm assuming Bolivia has two shares. The theory with the equal weight is you will lag when the big guys are running and you will win when the small guys, when the, when the big guys are, are, are underperforming. What we've seen in our local market is we've been driven by a couple of heavyweights doing well, most notably Richmond and Naspas, collectively about a third of the index. The argument is one day that will stop happening. Of course, by then I'm going to be old and gray at this rate. The other side of the coin, which is Christia's argument, is, man, this is just a market. You know, Soma own it. It'll sort itself out. I've got time on my side. Um, and she's probably right. So the ETF portfolios, these remain as they have for many years now. Uh, so what am I looking at? I'm saying you're high risk if you have more than 10 years until you need the money. I don't say retirement. I say need the money because maybe you're only 25, but you want to sell around the world at, at, when you're 40, in which case that's not retirement, that's sailing, and it's different, but you've got more than 10 years. I'm um, also, these are not Regulation 28 compliant, which is part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Pension Industry Act, which means you can only have so much offshore, etc. I'm assuming that most of us, if we're employed or have been employed, have got pension, provident or retirement annuities, and those will be Regulation 28 compliant. So what we've got is basically a split 40-40 between local and offshore, and then 20% into property. Um, I'm going to do some tweaks. I'll come to them in a moment. It is fairly aggressive. It is designed to be fairly aggressive. I know that the local part component is a 60-odd percent of, of local equities are of top 40 earns their money beyond the borders of South Africa. Um, in that ETF, I try to run the number, and it comes out closer to 50 percent because of how the weightings are done. But they're earning money in, in dollars and, and, and rimbies and nairas and all the other different currencies floating around locally, uh, mostly not into Africa. It's mostly the earnings are the are, are rest of the developed world, excluding Africa. Shop right an exception, but not much happening in the Africa space. Very aggressive, uh, returning money, but uh, not setting the world alight. It's not designed to set the world alight. That's for the individual portfolios. We move to the mid-level risk, which is saying if I need the money in the next 10 years. And the key difference we do there is we bring in what is called NFILBI, which is an inflation-linked government bond, South African government. And folks out there say, yeah, but you don't want government bonds. The governments will default. Governments don't default anymore. Here's why. The government owns the printing press. They've got to pay back a bond. Sorry, sir, give me five minutes while I quickly print up. How much did it? And they print it up and they pay you the money. Now, I know what you're saying. Ooh, inflation. Ooh, inflation is a lovely thing. If I owe you 100 bucks and inflation is rampant, I'll pay you tomorrow. Why? Because the 100 bucks will be worth less. Now, I know economics and everything, and this is all bad and everything. The truth is that the idea of default, so default was big in the 70s and the 80s, uh, Latin American countries to a large degree, uh, shaking off World Bank loans, etc. lots of defaults happening. Um, in the last, this, this century, the only default, so Greece did a haircut, which is weird, it's like half a default, um, and Argentina did a default in 2002. But Argentina last year issued a 100-year government bond. <coughs> And it was three times subscribed, oversubscribed. 100 years. No one is buying that to maturity because no one's living, well, I mean, someone's living 100 years, right? But it's none of us. As I always say, it's my mother-in-law. She plans to watch me the whole way. So don't worry about default. What's nice about this? Inflation plus. In other words, if we have rampant inflation, we have rampant return in that ETF. It's designed, those, <clears throat> those bonds, the government issues them, and in fact, so does the SA retail government bond people, I forget their official name. You can get a 10-year inflation plus 3.5% bond, and that is, to my mind, the most brilliant thing in the world to invest in, except for one problem, tax, because they pay you interest, and interest is taxable. But they're guaranteeing you that your money will go 3.5% 3.5% above inflation, which means you're guaranteed to create wealth. Nothing here guarantees anything. Now, I guarantee you that it will go up, down, or sideways in some order of which I'm not sure. Now, you guarantee you 3.5% ahead of inflation, you create wealth. And then, of course, the tax man comes and destroys it all. 
So there we bring in the, the uh, uh, NF, uh, NFLB, which brings in government bond, which reduces some of the risk to the portfolio because you're now quite close. And then if you are currently using the money because you are selling around the world or you are 104 years old and you thought it was time to dip into your savings, then what I do is I bring in cash as well, which is NF Tracy, which is a, those bottom two are ABSA products. And that is literally just cash. And, you know, check the rate. Maybe you can get a better rate at your bank or something like that. The reason why you have a lot of cash and near cash is that you never want to be a forced seller. So if you're living off this, this is for when you are needing the money now. If the market crashes, you don't want to have to be selling your ETS when the market is crashing. You want to be selling your ETS when the market is rampaging higher. So when markets are crashing, you use the cash that you've got. And when markets are rampaging higher, you sell the ETFs. It means you sell at your own timing rather than at your need to, 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 to live and, and provide money. So those are how they've sat for a number of years. My portfolio reflects the high-risk one because I'm more than 10 years from running away somewhere, uh, that one there, um, and I'm comfortable with that. So what changes do we want to look for? So the new one coming out from... Core shares is interesting. The Dividend Aristocrats Global. The code is G-L-O-D-I-V. It will list on 22nd of February. It is to a degree kind of like it's global, but it's different to the MSCI world, which is the Satrix, sorry, the Signia, the uh, Stanlib, and the Satrix. And the difference is, is that the world index just takes on market cap, so it has a lot more infotech IT in it. In truth, the biggest sector is, is actually financials and then tech. Whereas in your dividend aristocrats, your biggest sector is consumables, i.e. toothpaste, shampoo, stuff like that. Now, we can elect not to use banks because, you know, they rip us off. We can elect not to buy a new iPhone because, you know what, the old one still works. But I hope we don't elect to not brush our teeth and wash our hair. I mean, we could, but, like, you know, I, so the thing with consumer stables is they're much more safe. In good times, we can elect, you know, but there's some things we can't choose. We need to eat. We need to be presentable. And that's what the consumer stables are. So in essence, it's trying to be low risk and it's de-weighted the, the hip tech stuff. Now, the debate is up for you personally as to whether you want the hot tech stuff. The hot tech stuff is right now lacquer. Uh, we've seen the story before. Will it end the same? I don't know. But the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons of the world are, are dominant in, in an MSCI world, whereas they are not in the dividend aristocrats. The TERS are, except for the, the Satrix have come in at a crazy TER. I get these from fact sheets and from ETFSA. Um, those bottom two are target TERS. We will see what they pan out at. In truth, the Satrix is a target TER as well because that ETF hasn't been running for a full year yet either. And then there is the, uh, the Ashburton 1200, which I spoke about, which is the true global. The thing with the world MSCI, that one, those three there, and with the dividend aristocrats, no emerging markets. That's not completely true because there's emerging market by the fact that Coca-Cola operates globally. But there's no direct emerging market. The question is, does that matter? And it comes back to my one ETF to rule them all theory. We get emerging market exposure. If emerging markets are booming, Coca-Cola is selling more Coke in those markets. Apple is selling more overpriced phones and so on and so on. So don't we capture it all in something like the Ashburton 1200? The plan of the uh, MSCIs is they capture 85% of global equity. So when the planet is doing well, that will do well. That extra 15 is your EMs and the like, which they bring into that space there. We had a presentation here last Tuesday. Chris Rule from CoreShares was doing it. Um, and one of the things we were looking at is the MSCI world versus the uh, global dividend aristocrats. Um, and the whole point of the MSCI world is, sorry, of the, of the dividend aristocrats, is that typically in booming markets, it will do less well than the MSCI because it hasn't got those tech hip companies. It's got, you've got to have 25 years of dividend track record to be in the U.S. component. Even for the Asian parts, you've got to have seven years of, of continual dividend increases, which excludes a 
vast number of companies just because either they don't have the track record or they don't have that history. They haven't been around that long. So the global dividend aristocrats, in theory, will do less well in a bull market, but will do less poorly in a bear market because it hasn't got those high flyers. And if you blend them together, the theory being is that you get the middle black line, which is just perfectly, gently, and lovelyly smooth. I have a problem with blending them together because I think we're trying to get smart again. And I think that kind of defeats the purpose of, of what ETFs are about. My call would be, pick one, understand the distinction. The MSCI world is going to be a lot more bouncy and volatile. And over the long term, in theory, give you better returns. So it's a question of how do you like to sleep at night? Do you check your ETF portfolio every night before you go to bed? Hey, I used to. Nothing to be ashamed of. If you do, then you probably want, well, if you do, you see, uh, yeah, it's choice. I mean, if I had to pick one of those, and I'm picking neither for the record, but we'll come to that in a second. If I had to pick one of those, to me, it's okay. So you want the higher risk, you take the MSCI world. You want the lower risk, you take the dividend aristocrats. So changes for 2018, take some prop tracks 10 and split into global property. When we initially put this together, there was no global property. Benefit of global property is twofold. First, offshore currency, which in the next couple of years will probably hurt us, but in the long term will benefit us. The other benefit is bigger width. We have three types of listed property in this country. I know that there's a, the storage people, but they smaller exclude them. Broadly, our, our property companies um, hold commercial, industrial, and retail. But as soon as you move global, it changes. You've got residential property. You've got storage. You've got companies that only invest in medical, in other words, hospitals. You've got others that invest in data centers where folks like Amazon and, 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 and Facebook and stuff store their data. Suddenly, you get a much broader range. And the way the ETF works is as that new, you know, data centers 20 years ago didn't exist. Now suddenly data centers are one of the biggest, hottest property things in the world. So data centers now start to take more space in that global property ETF. It's 40 biggest uh, property stocks around the world. And they start to take more space into it. And then what happens is when data centers become passe and the new fancy property is, I don't know, selling plots of land on Mars, well, that will then bubble its way into the index. And this is the beauty of ETFs. The hot stuff rises to the top, and the unhot stuff eventually falls its way out the bottom. And it self-corrects itself. So you're always going to have the new hot stuff. It takes a little bit of time to get there. But the beauty of it is you don't have to make that decision. You don't have to say, now's the time to buy data centers. Man, you let the market work that out and it'll pop up in your ETF and you don't have to make the decision of now's the time to sell them because you know, when the day's over, they'll start to fade their way out. The other thing, a lot of folks have said to me, oh no, we need more spice in these portfolios. They're too boring and they're designed to be boring. That's their total absolute intent is to be boring. But if you want to really add some spices, take some of it and go and take yourself, go look at some, some of the, 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 the Cloud Atlas, the, the Africa, because we get... Truthfully, very little Africa exposure in this market. Now, there are broadly three areas, and I understand Africa is a continent, not a country, but we've got the India, we've got the China, we've got Africa. All of them are about a billion plus, all of them with massive capacity. China, we can frankly just go by NASPASS, we get 10 cent, 10 cent is China. Um, and China's fairly far down the, the road. India is a deeply interesting economy. Impossible to buy, although maybe in time we'll get a nifty 50. But India also has challenges. The beauty with China is if, if they want to do something, they do it, right? Because they're not really a democracy. It's like, you know, just move. We're China. Just, uh, and people move. They build. Uh, and, you know, I mean, China has more high speed railroad, has five times more high speed railroads than the rest of the world. Why? Because they thought. It's a high-speed thing. It's a good idea. Let's build some. They don't have to do feasibilities. They just have to say, is it straight? That's all that matters. Um, China has ghost cities. You know, they literally, they go build a city for 400,000 people. Who lives there? No one. There's a high-speed train stop, but the train doesn't stop yet because no one lives there. And the rest of the world is, that's crazy. China's like, no, man, come on, guys. We have got uh, 300 million people living in rural poverty. We want to move them to the city. You can't move them until you build the city. You build the city first. 
But China's done this. India has challenges. 50-odd provinces, multiple languages, and unfortunately this messy thing called democracy. Where you can't just say, so move. You gotta say, uh, yeah, it gets complicated like that. And and then Africa more so, because of course we are and it depends where you fall on the Western Sahara story and the South Sudan story. We are 50 plus uh, countries, and I'm not going to put a number to tell you where I stand, but we are a lot of countries um, and a lot of languages and a lot of politicians. But the big growth spurt is going to come via Africa and to a degree India. And, and so maybe some Africa space in there, because our local market has got little exposure into Africa. Sure, Standard Bank's got a bit. Uh, ShopRite's probably 20%. Um, I'm trying to, th I mean, you know, NASPASS has got a tiny bit, but no one cares about NASPASS apart from Tencent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some spice, the Ashburton Mid, there's an S missing, that should be Ash Mid, which is our, our, our mid cap, as I said, and our, S, our very much SA Inc. Maybe you want to add some tech. So Standard is bringing in S&P Infotech, which is just tech stuff in there. There's also the uh, Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution ETF. Between those two, I prefer the Stanlib. The, S, the Signia Fourth Industrial is what I call a black box. In other words, there's a third party called Kenzo who decide the constituents. And they just tell you that they do a Fourth Industrial, and that's great, but I, I want, you know, they, 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 they light on the details as to how they decide. Whereas the S&P S&P Infotech, you can go to the S&P Dow Jones Industrial website and they will tell you exactly how they design this index, what's in it, how you get in and out, et cetera, et cetera. So that's if you want to add some spice. I started earlier in the presentation talking about how we've got to be careful about spice. We've got to be careful about being overly active. But putting this presentation together over the course of this week um, and trying not to be sidetracked by politicians, it occurred to me that probably we would like a little bit of spice. And I get that we're kind of breaking the rules of degree by going that route and everything and we're being overly active, etc. But truthfully, we are sitting here at the JSC. We are kind of active in that space. And 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 a little bit, you know, 5% of your portfolio and, and, and some little spice at the bottom is probably not going to break the bank, bring some interest into it, and might actually give you some nice return. The question you've got to decide is how do you like your spice? Yeah. I'm from Durban, so for me it's out and out chilly, but you might like it a little bit more Cape Townian with like fruit or something. That's a personal choice. Um, other changes as bonds, we're seeing two global ETF bonds coming in March, one from Stanlib, one from Ashburton, low yield offshore currency. Uh, you might want to take some of your local bond exposure and switch it into that. I want to get more details of those two ETFs. The details I've seen so far are scant before we make decisions. As I understand, certainly the Stanlib one is the G7 nations. So it's not just one country, it's the big seven countries and it's their bonds. Uh, looking at my portfolio, um, so when we look at one portfolio, one ETF to rule them all, and we haven't made a, a decision on this, but the one we talked about, um, and the reason why I put the podcast link up there earlier is because we actually discussed it in a podcast, justonelap.com slash fatwallet, find the one ETF to rule them all, is which ETF at this point, if we were to say one to rule, which would it be? And it's like, well, surely it's the Ashburton 1200. Because it's global, it includes EMs, it excludes South Africa, but that's your global EM, it's got a nice tour ratio. So I'm going to start switching Signia Worlds into that. Um, it drops me by Africa, the tour ratio is about a half a percent lower. It's going to cost me half a percent to do the transaction, but it means my payback period is in the first year. Um, and I'm going to split my PropTrax 10 into some offshore property as well. Am I adding spice to my portfolio? Nope, I own Capitec, man, that's enough spice right now. Remember, I have active portfolio as well. Half of my portfolio is ETS, but I have my spice sits in my long term, my medium term, and my trading. I am taking that 50%. It's actually currently sitting when I last checked at the end of last year at about 53.5%. And ultimately, my target is to get that core ETF up to 75%. It's going to take me a couple of years. Why am I taking it up to 75%? Because the biggest risk to my portfolio is me doing stupid stuff. 
you know, I mean, I, I didn't buy, I didn't own Steinhoff, but for example, owning Steinhoff or, you know, or, or you know, and, and so owning Steinhoff wasn't the problem. The problem was owning it at 90 bucks and still owning it at six. Um, and I've done that, man. I've been there. I got the t-shirt. I lost the t-shirt. Um, the, the risk is me and I'm, 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 I'm getting old now. So it's time to start de-risking that risk. I'm actually just getting lazy. I want to go surfing. Um, so I'm pushing that ETF up. Oh, my target is 75%. It's going to take me a bit of time to get there. Also look at rebalancing. So you start the year and you've got 40, 40, 20, whatever those ratios are. They're nice. They're lovely. They fit. Everything's cool. And then over the course of the year, this one runs and that one doesn't. And then at the end of the year, your balances are all out of kilter. Now, the classic old-fashioned way is we'll sell the one that's big and buy the – but we're depositing new money into our accounts. So nice and simple. The one that's a little underweight, give it a little more money. The one that's overweight, give it a little less money and get your balances back into, 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 into kilter again. Transfers are happening on the 1st of March, 2018, unless your provider is not ready. In which case, my advice, go stand at their door, maybe with a red overall and a stick bang on their door. So Treasury, National Treasury has said, and I have confirmed it with them, that their rulers, 1st of March 2018, you can move a tax-free account from one provider to another provider. This will be happening. The truth is, will all the providers be ready? I'll tell you on the 2nd of March. Why would you transfer? Because you've got an overly expensive account. They're charging you 1% a year and it's now starting to add up. They don't have the product range that you like. A lot of folks I know put, got into cash-only ETFs, basically call accounts, and they want to, or, or rather uh, uh, cash tax-free accounts. You know, or maybe you were with that bank, but you don't like the bank anymore and you want to move everything, including current accounts and stuff like that. Transfers will be available from 1st of March at most providers. However, be gentle, be careful with them because we are the guinea pigs here, right? And if we transfer it wrong, we don't want to lose our tax-free status. In other words, you know, speak to both parties, double-check those forms, be, be careful with the transfers. What I'm worried about is I move from here to here, and when I get here, it's no longer recognized as tax-free. And I don't want to have to go and fight with people about, yeah. So, frankly, I'm going to not transfer anything. I'm going to let other people go first, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy with my provider for now, so that's fine. Budget speech on Wednesday by a finance minister still to be decided, and we might see increases to annual contributions. We will find out on Wednesday. If the increase is increased, if the contribution, it will likely be effective 1st of March. In other words, you can't pony more money now. You pony money then. So, I, tax for your accounts. I said right up front, the finance minister is giving you money. Take advantage. Everybody should have one. Ignore short-term market gyrations. Markets go up, markets go down. We are long-term investors. What do markets do over the long term? They go up. They create wealth. But if we're busy panicking and we're selling here and selling there, what we typically do is we destroy wealth because we sell too late and we buy too late. So we don't sell at the top, we sell at the bottom. And then we don't buy at the bottom, we buy at the top. And you're just actually getting poor. The, the design feature of an ETF is buy it, forget about it, come back in many, many, many years' time, decades' time. Nice and simple. Um, keep it simple. Watch those costs. And of your discretionary investments, fill up your tax-free first. Don't go buy Steinhoff. Fill up your tax-free. When your tax-free is full, now you can go buy Steinhoff. And don't anyone here think I'm telling you to buy Steinhoff. Let's be very, very clear on that. <laughs> Tongue firmly in cheek. What I'm saying is, your active portfolio is cool, but initially fill up your tax-free. Because A, you're the biggest risk, and B, tax-free. Your active portfolio is not tax-free. And you might go and buy the wrong share, whichever share that may be. It used to be easy for me. I used to know what the wrong share was. As soon as I bought it, it was the wrong share. <laughs> Contact details, legal disclaimers, I've run my time, but if there's a quick question or two, I will take them. Otherwise, you can chat to me after. As soon as we have no SONA pressure, SONA is tomorrow. So. Who monitors the 500K? Who monitors the 500K? SARS. So, 
the way it works is the accounts are flagged in a special way at the individual stockbroker FSP levels, and then that data is submitted to SARS in bulk upload and flagged as a as tax free. That's how they can monitor the, the the annual contributions from multiple potential vendors. So you might have an account with four different banks. But if you put 33 in each, they would like, no, nah, so sorry, you've only got one. And ultimately, that 500. Truthfully, the onus is on you to track it, though. So, because SARS will only phone you if you go over. They're not going to phone you and say, sir, you're getting close. They're going to phone you and say, sir, you went over, send money. So, you need to track it yourself. We're done. Ladies and gents, we will leave it there. Appreciate your time this evening. Uh, I hope you all make your tax-free accounts grow nice, slowly, over many, many, many decades. Uh, we'll be back. Actually, I think we're back in April. We're here again uh, with another presentation. Until then, thank you very much for your time this evening. <laughs>